Here is chapter one of how Moons of Darcelon was made, the retro style video game I developed solo, not feeling comfortable with how modern retro style video games looked. Therefore, I had no choice but to create my own system. Camera system. How is it usually done? You create a camera that films your pixelated sprites, and that's it. This is how all games are made, whether pixelated or not. However, this is inconsistent with a strictly retro aesthetic. Why? Because doing it this way can position pixels off their grid and likely create pixels of inconsistent sizes. Even from one frame to another, pixels can suffer mutations due to size changes, creating an unpleasant visual effect. This example shows a Unity system to avoid these problems, but it's not too clear to me if it works well because, in the same example, in the top section that is supposedly the good one, we can see pixels of different sizes and a kind of random dithering, which I don't know if it's due to a poorly made GIF or something else. Unity promises to perform the necessary calculations so that the pixels don't change size according to the monitor's resolution, and this is how it should be done. Whether it works well, I don't know, because this came out in 2018, and I already had my own system working in 2015. There are some good articles where they talk about all this and even present their own solutions. Although I get the impression that not many people care about this, as I still see a multitude of games with mutant pixels today. How does Moons of Darcelon do it? There are two main cameras. World camera. This is the camera that films the world, the action. It is a low resolution camera that films onto a texture. This means that what it films will not be shown directly on the screen. The pixels rendered by its field of vision are written to a special texture called render texture. This texture has the large pixel size. In other words, if you are viewing 386 large pixels wide by 218 large pixels high in the game, the render texture is 386 by 218. This is the most efficient way to achieve consistent pixel sizes. But this is not enough. The size of the render texture and, consequently, the number of large pixels that fit is determined by the screen resolution. The game will not display the same retro resolution or large resolution on a 1920 by 1080 screen as on a 4K screen, nor on any intermediate resolutions. Based on the screen resolution, you can calculate retro resolutions that will fit well on this screen. Some will give you large pixels of 3x3, others of 4x4, 5x5, and even 6x6. Once this retro resolution size and the pixel zoom we are going to use are calculated, you have to adjust the camera to film an area that fits perfectly with the chosen retro resolution and also define the size of the render texture to the same size. So you have to do some calculations to adjust the size of the camera and the render texture so that the pixels always have the same size. Once you overcome the difficulties of creating this system to keep the pixels perfectly aligned on their grid and with consistent sizes, you realize a problem, which is that slow movements are not smooth. The large pixel size is too large to produce smooth movement while staying aligned on its grid, which is not a major issue for everything happening in the action plane, but looks a bit jerky in the parallax. The slower the movement of the mountains and the background layers, the jerkier it looks giving the impression that they move in jumps. How to solve this without breaking the strict rules of retro aesthetics? You can't. You can optimize the code to avoid decimals in position calculations and minimize the jitters, something Moons of Darcelon does to run in fully retro resolutions like 320x240 on a CRT. This slightly affects the speeds at which the mountains move, since they have to always move with relative differences of one. If the first parallax layer moves one pixel, the second layer should move one pixel only when the first has moved two, and the third layer should do the same, but every three pixels. But this is quite an acceptable solution for CRT monitors, where the sharp pixel movements are softened by the very nature of the CRT, which has more ghosting than a modern screen. Additionally, pixels do not look like perfect squares. Instead, they are seen through the shadow mask grid of the CRT, and also have a slight blur. All of this softens the jitters. So what do we do on modern monitors? There are two options. Either be strict and accept the jitters, or allow subpixel movement for things like the parallax. 
This is the option I chose because I believe the stepped movement of the parallax produces more negative effects than breaking this retro rule, which in reality, no one takes into account today. But how will you achieve sub-pixel movement with a camera that renders to render texture at a resolution that doesn't allow positioning pixels outside their grid? Well, with another camera, the fixed camera. This is a camera located at coordinates far enough from the world so that they never affect each other. It films the parallax planes that are positioned in front of it. But also, in front of the parallax, we have a quad object, which is nothing more than a plane to which we can assign the texture filmed by the world camera. This quad or plane must have the same dimensions as the render texture. And the area filmed by the camera must be adjusted in the same precise way to avoid pixel distortion. If you've done it right, you'll have your action plane filmed again by this new camera. What happens? Where there was nothing to film in the world, it stays transparent in the render texture, allowing us to see the parallax behind. As the fixed camera is filming at the native resolution of our screen, the parallax sprite pixels can move in intermediate positions, thus making smooth movement possible. Additionally, you must ensure that the pixels with which the parallax is drawn are at scale 1, to match the size of the pixels of the render texture. All of this together will be scaled to the native resolution size of the monitor so that, as we previously did the correct calculations, all large pixels will be the same size. In the next chapter, I will cover how to automatically palette colors to go from this to this. And additionally, how to make the pixels look like they did on analog CRT screens to capture all the nostalgia that comes with it. Subscribe so you don't miss it.